Um, I can turn on an auto record option, but then it starts recording as soon as I start the meeting. And that's usually like five minutes of me just sitting here. And uh, it's a lot of effort to go back and, and trim that later. As, as stupid as that sounds, it seems like it should be really easy. Um, content creation on YouTube and with Zoom is not as simple as it seems. It takes a lot of time because you have to re-render everything just for chopping off five minutes at the beginning of the meeting. So thanks for reminding me. All right, so we have our, our SP3 carbon circled in red here, and then what does that inherently tell us about the geometry? Tetrahedral. The tetrahedral. Exactly, they're gonna be tetrahedral. Um, the electron geometry specifically will be tetrahedral. When we have lone pairs taking up space, they can affect the hybridization, just like they would affect the electron geometry but um, the, the molecular geometry would be different. So for instance, um, if we looked at, methyl amine, both of these groups, both of these central atoms have four electron groups around them, right? So they're both going to have a tetrahedral electron geometry and they're both going to be sp3 hybridization um, but the because the nitrogen's lone pair we can't see it we can just see that it pushes the other groups into a tetrahedral shape so that the molecular geometry here would be trigonal pyramidal but it doesn't really matter as long as we remember that the electron geometry is going to be that tetrahedral shape and that the lone pair is there taking up space Right, so I'm not, I'm not going to specifically test you guys on all of those other geometry, molecular geometry names, um, because all that matters is that you know the hybridization, basically, and that you know the electron geometry. All right, and then how about, let's go back to our compound here. These two carbons that have three electron groups that have a single pi bond, but still have four total bonds. So they still have a full valence, but only three electron groups. Those are going to only have three hybridized orbitals, which would make them... SP2. SP2. Your cat has good timing. Mine does that too. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they'd be SP2, so it'd be trigonal pyramidal, or sorry, trigonal planar. Um, which we saw also with the um, with the oleic acid in the lab, right there. The oleic acid had the one double bond right in the middle of that compound that made those carbons planar. Man, this being the first week of classes and having all this smoke around is really doing a number on my throat. Um, so then our last. Our last set of carbons here, might as well pick another color. And this would be one case where control Z doesn't work apparently. Um, our last set of carbons here only have two sigma bonds from each carbon. So they're each going only going to have two hybridized orbitals which would make them SP and make them linear as well, because they're only going to have two electron groups around that, um, each of those carbons. All right, make, make sense? Does that uh, remind everybody where we left off the other day? Any, yeah. any, any questions so far on, on the hybridization stuff? It's really, like I said, it's really just another another way to refer to the, the electron geometry. So once you get your head around that, it's using those terms instead of tetrahedral or in addition to tetrahedral is, and things like that. It's not too tricky. Um, and here's another good figure here of what a pi bond might look like. So if we have, um, this is acetylene, which is a carbon triple bonded to another carbon with a hydrogen on each end. So each carbon has a total of four bonds, 
Um, and the carbons, the bonds that are drawn in gray here are going to be those sigma bonds, those single bonds where you have the hybridized orbitals. But and then these pi bonds, the double, the second and third bond between the carbons, um, they're not the same energy as that first bond. So that's, that's why we have two different terms to, to refer to these types of bonds. The second and the third bonds are both pi bonds. And so they're going to be pretty equivalent to each other, but they're not going to be the same as the sigma bond, which is shaped different because it's made out of those hybridized orbitals. We can't use the hybridized orbitals to make the, the pi bonds because they have to be above and below the carbon, or they have to be not right in between the two carbon atoms. You need space um, for those orbitals to take up. And so that's why they stay as the unhybridized p orbitals, which again is the, um, the, that sort of figure eight balloon shape above and below. So the red part up top and the blue part below it is one p orbital that is being mixed in with the same p orbital on the other side, with same same phase p orbital on the other side. And when you mix those together, you can get some orbital overlap. And so that's why you get, that's how the, why the pi bonds are shaped differently there. So let's, I wanna try doing a, a zoom poll here. So you guys all, and we'll see how this, oh, do I have to add it? Okay. We're gonna try this. I'm gonna type, just type this in real quick. When more than a single bond is formed between two nuclei, the nuclei will be A, closer together, B, the same distance, or C, farther apart. Farther apart, not farther apart. I don't think the paternity of the nuclei has anything to do with this. All right, and where'd my mouse go? Right, let's try that. All right. So Four or five out of you guys said closer together. A few said the same distance and a few said farther apart. Those of you guys who said the same distance, why did you think they'd be the same distance apart? Just one in three chance. It's early in the morning. Um, because those pi bonds are, they're above and below. Yeah, so they're not really, they're not in between it's the two like nuclei, so it makes sense that they, they shouldn't be too affected. Um, but on the other hand, that also means that we have fewer electron groups kind of pushing things away, right? So um, the, they actually wind up being closer together because in order to make these pi bonds, you actually have to get the nuclei closer together so that those p orbitals can overlap enough. So remember that these bonds are all formed by getting these orbitals kind of into the same space. And so if you have unhybridized p or orbitals that are trying to overlap to make these pi bonds, you need to get them closer together or you're not gonna be able to get them to form any sort of attractive force or not a significant one. Farther apart would also make sense just in the, in the sense that you have more electrons in the same space and they would naturally push each other away. So you could, you could make a, a good argument from your guys' point of view for any of those options, but they do wind up being closer together just because otherwise you won't get those bonds forming at all. 
let's um, let's try another one. Let's see if I can. I have not played around with this. Here's another one. There we go. Um, if we form more than one, one bond between the two nuclei, the bond energy will be, I'm not going to type the whole question in this time. With the bond energy between the two nuclei, be the same, would it be, would the bond energy be larger, meaning that it'd be harder to break the atoms apart? Or would it be e easier to break the atoms apart? Oh, I have to type a question. All right, what are you guys' thoughts? The harder to break them apart seems to be the early consensus, almost uniform consensus. I guess that's the definition of consensus, right? Um, so why do you think it would be harder to break them apart? It just seems like there's more forces at play. Yeah, we still have the same sigma bond, right? So, and then we added these other two bonds that are each going to have some attractive force as well, right? So in, now in order to break, to break um, the two carbons apart, we have to break not just the sigma bond, but both of the pi bonds as well. So and go with your intuition on that one. More bonds is harder to break apart. Would it be three times as hard? Would, the, would you expect the bond energy to be three times as hard as a single bond or something less than that, something more than that? Are the, uh, what I'm really trying to get at is, are the pi bonds going to be as strong as the sigma bond? I've seen people shake their heads no. I think the pi bond's gonna be weaker. Why? But, um, I don't have a good explanation for that. No. Yeah. You're right. Your, your intuition was right on that. The pi bonds are going to be weaker than the sigma bond. Um, it's because of that orbital overlap. You can't get the orbitals to overlap as well when they're pi bonds because they're stuck in that above and below shape. They can't get directly on top of each other. So acetylene is harder to break apart than ethane, which is two carbons with all sig single bonds. Ethane be C2H6. So two tetrahedral carbons bonded together is easier to break ethane apart than acetylene. Um, but those pi bonds break do break easily compared to a single bond. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you need, why um, acetylene burns at a higher temperature than ethane. Ethane's natural gas. We don't use ethane or methane, which is also natural in natural gas at, um, as a welding gas, because it doesn't burn quite as hot. Acetylene is, it's a little bit harder to break the carbons apart in acetylene, but there's um, less energy in it overall because you have two pi bonds mixed in there as opposed to all single bonds, which are more stable and therefore more energy, have more energy in them. And that's in fact what we see. If we look at ethane versus ethylene, which is two carbons doubly bound together versus acetylene, the bonds do get shorter as you add more pi bonds. 
because you have mostly just because you have fewer electron groups taking up space. So there's fewer things pushing up everything else away. And also because the closer you get these two carbons, the more overlap you get in those pi bonds. And then when we look at the bond energy, we actually have ways we can measure directly how much energy it takes to break apart a single bond. Um, you guys remember Hess's law, right? Where you can add up all the different bond energies um, that are, like I, like I said, my cat does this too. Um, all the different bond energies before and after. And so you can actually just burn this stuff and then calculate where all the energy is coming from. Um, what bond bonds have what energy just by adding up the bonds that are there before and after. Um, and we do see that the bond energy between two carbons is 368 for a sigma bond. For a pi bond or for a double bond, the total bond energy is 632. So less than double. Um, and if we actually subtract out, so if we think of that double bond as a sigma bond and a pi bond, we can actually subtract out the 368 to get the energy of a pi bond. And the energy of the two pi bonds should be really close together because they're pretty close to the same. My cat's needy today. Um, so 368 minus, or 632, I should say. 632 minus 368, and we get 264 kilojoules per mole for a pi bond. And that should be close to the difference between 820 and 632. And it's not, it's uh, still significantly less. That triple bond ha is even easier to break than the double bond. In theory, the pi bonds should be very close to the same. Um, energy, but because that bond is closer together, they're not quite the same energy. Can I ask a question? Please. So, uh, as they get, as we get like from a single to a double to a triple, the, the bond strength increases, but that graph you showed us on Tuesday, I mm -hmm. think, didn't it say like at a certain point when they get too close, something happens? Am I on the right track? Yeah, no. so the, it absolutely does. We're, we're sort of, when we add more bonds, we add pi bonds between the same two nuclei, where we can shift where that point is, where that, that um, global minimum is. By, Basically, we're, we're affecting which forces are there. And we're, we're adding what's called shielding, which is basically if you have orbitals in between two nuclei, they're going to physically get in, in the way and prevent those two positive charges on the nuclei from getting um, as close to each other. So if you think if we got energy, and we just call R for radius, the distance, a single bond might have some something that looks like this, but then as we add these pi bonds, it'll get, the minimum will get a little bit closer together. The radius gets a little bit shorter between those two nuclei. So good question, and it, and it has to do with the fact that, yeah, with more electrons in there, you have less of that repulsive force between the two nuclei. And the, the, you have the same amount of that force, um, but you have more electrons in the way, kind of mitigating it. All right. Any other questions on hybridization and, and uh, bond energies? We're going to keep going here. Go back to screen share. All right. Let's talk about electronegativity. Um, I had a friend in college who did, uh, um, we went to a small college that had um, a lot of opportunities for us to do research over the summers. If you were a chemistry major, um, you got to basically live on campus in the summer and, and work with one of the professors on doing some research. Um, and he did his research with, uh, with an organic chemist um, who, and he was fond of saying that the right answer to any Pretty much any question you can ask in organic chemistry can always be traced back to electronegativity. So electronegativity is going to be one of those answers where 
Um, if I ask you why something happens, you can say electronegativity and you're probably not wrong. There might be more to it than that. You might be, have a hard time explaining why, um, but it, it's very, very critical when we start looking at um, why things happen in, in terms of mechanisms. Um, so just a reminder of how the periodic table works when it comes to electronegativity, closer to the top right. So let's ignore the noble gases because they're boring um, and they're not organic anyway. Um, closer to the top right, is going to be more electronegative, better at pulling electrons in towards themselves. And then other than a few cases that when we get to um, organometallics, um, so other than things like aluminum and magnesium, we don't really care about any of the metals in organic chemistry either. Um, so we're mostly looking at just this top right corner. Fluorine is going to be the most electronegative, then oxygen, Nitrogen and chlorine are pretty close together. And then carbon is, is sort of our, our middle ground in between the metals and the non-metals. So carbon and hydrogen, hydrogen actually is the definition of the middle between a metal and a non-metal. Anything that's more electronegative than hydrogen is a non-metal. Anything less electronegative than hydrogen is a metal. I actually haven't looked at the numbers to make sure that that's the case on this on this graph, but it's going to be very close to anything that's close to the same electronegativity as hydrogen is going to be in that metalloid region between the metals and the nonmetals, right along that stair step between those two. Should go right here. All right, so. How is electronegativity going to affect these geometries? Well, it doesn't affect the geometries directly. The, the names of the geometries, the shapes themselves aren't going to change. We're basically going to get sort of variations of the same shape. Um, so if you, if you have a very polar bond, like you put a fluorine onto a carbon, they are still going to share electrons between the two. You're still going to get a covalent bond between the carbon and the fluorine. But because the fluorine is more electronegative, it's not going to share evenly between the two. So instead of having a nice uniform um, symmetrical pi or a sigma bond between those two nuclei, it's going to look, it's still going to have the same basic shape, but more of it's going to be dragged towards the fluorine. Um, and that results in what we call, what's a, we refer to as a partial charge. We're not pulling enough of the electrons away from the carbon to say that the carbon has a complete charge, that the carbon, the carbon doesn't have a plus one charge because it still has eight electrons around it, all in single bonds. But because the fluorine pulls some of it away, it's got a partial positive on the carbon. And there's a partial negative on the fluorine because it's got a little bit of an extra electron. Remember, I mean, electrons are physical objects. So you can't have a part of an electron. But remember that if we're talking about sharing things back and forth, we go back to that, that pair of snowmobiles that you bought with your friend. It's like if your, your friend's got more room at his house and so the snowmobiles, you know, they stay at his house more of the time. Right, so technically, everybody still owns one snowmobile, but really it's more like he has two snowmobiles 80% of the time and you have two snowmobiles 20% of the time. Um, and we represent those partial charges with this lowercase d um, or lo lowercase delta, which is not the same lowercase delta that we use in um, calculus to differentiate between, uh, differentiate, um, to tell the difference between the delta that you use in calculus and the delta that you use in chemistry, we use the one that has the little, the little tail that goes back the other way at the top. Um, and so anytime you see that, that just means a partial charge, partial positive, partial negative. So, and if we want to have a 
polar molecule, we need polar bonds, and we need um, we need an asymmetrical shape. In OCAM, we're going to have mostly asymmetrical shape once we get to larger and larger molecules because it's really hard to have a totally perfectly symmetrical molecule once you've got five carbons. Um, so asymmetry is not going to matter as much in OCAM as it did in GenChem for determining whether these molecules are polar. We're mostly going to be looking for polar bonds. And so let's, we'll practice drawing Lewis dot structures here again. And a reminder, basically for, for the sake of OCHEM, if you think of nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine attached to pretty much anything else, that's going to be a polar bond. If you remember those big, the big four, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine, attached to a carbon, attached to a hydrogen, um, are always going to give you that polar bond. Right, so our, if we look at our Lewis dot structures, so for CH two O, I don't like that pen anymore. Once we get used to um, paying attention to the, to the number of bonds rather than counting the electrons, um, we don't even really need to count the electrons. If we know that this whole molecule has an overall charge of zero, all we have to do is find a way that, to draw it so that the hydrogens have one bond, the carbon has four, and the oxygen has two. And as soon as we can do that, we can draw the structure. We don't need to go through and count the valence electrons. Um, so it's something that you guys will start getting better and better at. Um, this is good old formaldehyde. Does it have a polar bond? Yeah, between the carbon and the oxygen. The fact that there's a pi bond does not change the fact that it's polar. Oxygen is still more electronegative. And so the oxygen still will pull the electrons towards itself more. And does it have asymmetry with respect to where the electrons are being pulled? So I, when I, I made sure to say it that way, because you can draw a line right down the middle of this molecule and it looks symmetrical, right? But that's the electrons overall are being pulled towards the top of the molecule, towards the oxygen. If they're being pulled to the top of the molecule towards the oxygen, then the, it's not symmetrical with respect to where the electrons are being pulled. If we drew carbonate instead, now carbonate has it's same overall shape, it's trigonal planar, it still has polar bonds, but it's symmetric because all of these oxygens are going to pull the electrons towards themselves equally. So it's symmetrical with respect to where the electrons are being pulled. They're not being pulled more to one side of the molecule than another. So if we go back to formaldehyde, if we wanted to show where the partial charges were, oxygen's more electronegative, so it's going to be pulling the electrons towards itself more. So we'll have a partial negative charge at the top and a partial positive charge at the bottom. And you don't need to circle them. I typically do just because like with the lone pairs, it's easy to, to not see those. Sean, can you talk about your carbonate example? Um, you had more lone pairs on the bottom oxygens. Um, ha that doesn't affect um, the symmetry at all? It doesn't because, and we'll, we'll talk about, I mean, the, the main 
the main reason why is that it's similar to um, electronegativity. If, if it's the answer is not electronegativity in OCHEM, then the answer is almost certainly resonance. Um, resonance basically just means that if all of these oxygens, these oxygens have one bond each, one sigma bond each, and they oxygen is most stable with two bonds, right? And with them all being identical, you can basically have three different versions where this, uh, the pi electrons from one oxygen go back to that oxygen and one of these lone pairs move over to the carbon in the middle. And then you can have a third version where it's the, the third oxygen that has the pi bond. Right, so you can, so because you have these lone pairs that can all take turns sharing with that central carbon in the middle, they're all going to wind up being identical to each other, despite the fact that we would normally draw them one of the carbons with a pi bond and the other two with just a sigma bond. Um, they wind up being, it's really more like you've got a, a partial pi bond between each of the carbons or between each of the oxygens, it's like a third of a pi bond between each of them. So it winds up being symmetrical that way, even though if we're following our strict rules for Lewis dot structures, we would draw it as being one of the oxygens as having the pi bond and the others as being single. Um, and if we look at what the shape of that molecule is, of the shape of the orbitals for that one, let me see if I can find a good figure real quick. Molecular orbitals, carbonate. Ah, that'll do. It'll open. Of course, I happen to pick one that say an entire PowerPoint presentation. There it is. I'll screen share again. Um, if you look at this, this um, shape here, so this would be the what the pi orbitals for um, carbonate would actually look like. It would actually be spread. You wouldn't have one pi bond um, and then two normal sp3 hybridized oxygens. You would actually wind up with something that looks that looks more like this, where the pi electrons are spread out over the whole molecule. Um, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about resonance, especially when we get into things like benzene. Um, but basically, if you have pi electrons, if you have um, electrons in an unhybridized p orbital, they can move around a lot more between various, uh, towards other um, um, atoms, towards other nuclei in order to, because doing this, any anytime you can spread electrons out more, and make their orbitals bigger, they're going to become more stable because you're not forcing these unstable charges to be stuck in one spot. Letting them move around more is, is um, you know, like sharing, sharing doing the dishes with your roommates um, is a lot more stable than one person is stuck doing the dishes all the time, right? The more you can spread those around, the more stable they'll get. Um, and we'll talk about the rules for that, I think, next week, actually. Did I answer your question, John? Yes, thank you. Cool. Um, of these other two molecules, carbon tetrachloride, um, we do have polar bonds, but they're all going to be identical. So this is also like the carbonate example um, in that the carbon tetrachloride has polar bonds equally in all directions. So they're all going to be identical. They're all, the chlorines are all pulling the electrons away from the carbon, but they're doing it uniformly around that tetrahedral structure. So it would be nonpolar. And then our last example, nitrogen with two chlorines and a hydrogen. You might want to draw what this one looks like to see if we have polar bonds or not. So nitrogen wants to make three bonds, chlorine 
and hydrogen make one bond each. So do we have a polar molecule here? So the bonds between the nitrogen and the chlorine are going to be nonpolar, right? Because those are really close to the same strength. So nitrogen to chlorine, nitrogen to chlorine, those are both nonpolar. Nitrogen to a lone pair doesn't really, that's not a bond at all. So we can't call that a polar bond. Nitrogen to hydrogen, though, is a polar bond. And we definitely have asymmetry here, right? So we're going to wind up with a partial positive around the hydrogen and a partial negative kind of centered around the, the nitrogen. But, but really, this whole other half of the molecule is going to be partially negative. All right, that's, we're going to shift gears here on the next slide. So that's as good a place as any to take a quick break. Um, let's do 10 minute break and we'll come back at 10 till. All right, see you then.
How's your morning been going, Sean? Oh, always pretty busy. First thing in the morning. Doesn't, uh, you know, it's, it keeps us pretty busy. My, my son being, being at home, going to school because they have three zoom meetings a day for, um, for his classes too. And then, you know, lots of other, other stuff to do, but he's only in first grade. So I can't just, you know, tell him he has to do it at this time. <laughs> I have to help him with it also. Right. How's he adjusting to remote, remote learning? Um, yeah, he's got, we got really lucky. He's got a, he's got a great teacher who uh, really has jumped in and is really good at, at uh, the, the remote learning thing, but um, it's hard. It's hard because he doesn't get to see, see his friends and stuff like that. And um, especially with all the smoke that's been outside, it's, you know, we can't just, you know, okay, it's time to, you're done with this, go outside and play by yourself for recess for the next 10 minutes because, you know, be just playing by himself for 10 minutes and then told to come back in and sit back down and start working again. Um, but it's, it's going well. He's picking stuff up fast. He likes computers like me. So he, um, you know, lots of little web games about, about learning and reading and stuff like that are, are doing pretty well. He's picking that up pretty well. Plus you do, um, you know, basic learning or basic reading exercises on uh, as a web game and put like a, a point value to it. He loves trying to rack up high scores, um, earn earn stars that he can then spend on like build buying upgrades for his little character. And they found a way to, to gamify learning to read pretty well for for first graders. So that's cool. I used to love games like that when I was uh, younger. That I don't remember what they were specifically called or whatever, but they were definitely useful tools. Yeah. Yeah, and so he gets to play around with that a lot, which he he really likes, but. It's not the same. He's not getting quite, you know, nearly as, as much, um, you know, not and as much attention. And yeah, he's not, not as tired at the end of the day as he would be when he was going to, to school <laughs> physically, but it is what it is. It's looking like we might actually, this air quality might actually be a little bit better today. Yesterday was pretty rough. Yeah. It was yeah nice. It's supposed yeah. to be better today and the weekend over the weekend. Good. I can deal with it being cold as long as uh, as long as it's not as smoky. I don't even think I've looked outside yet. <laughs> Just want to pretend like it's normal out there. <laughs> Since we're talking about fluorine, thought I'd share a nice little chemistry mean <laughs> that's pretty good <laughs> you're not gonna get it man <laughs> then if you uh, if you're interested in uh, how chemists view um, other branches of chemistry I saw this one the other day physical chemistry mom there's a monster under my bed it's the most hideous thing i've ever seen but he's in the top top bunk bed with <laughs> organic chemistry that's pretty funny <clears throat> yeah that was fun kind of looking around for those things for the uh the discussion or whatever i definitely enjoyed that yeah we'll keep coming back to him because like i said now you guys have enough background in this that you guys have um you know a lot of uh, can understand a lot more chemistry humor than you could a year ago right now. Have you come across any of them that you haven't uh, seen before? I see a few, a few every, every day. I, I go to a lot of chemistry, chemistry teacher um, discussion boards and stuff online, trying to uh, keep up with what's going on um, with distance learning. So a lot of them get posted there. Yeah. I checked a few different sources and I saw a lot of like repeating stuff. It's like, ah, I guess there's only a handful of these. Yeah, there's, um, there's a fair bit. I think uh, Instagram has a fairly big, um, not fairly, not large, but uh, active um, chemistry community. 
um, if you know where to look and Reddit, stuff like that. There's some some social media stuff out there that focuses on the sciences, which is always fun. But anyway, let's get back to talking about our stuff for the day. Um, and so we'll go, let's go ahead and, and define some of our, our different structures. Um, and again, we saw some of this in the lab on Tuesday. Um, but the, you know, getting, getting ourselves these familiar with all the different ways we can draw these is, is pretty helpful. Um, when we've been drawing Lewis structures, which are also called the complete structures, um, that's what we're looking at here. Uh, is we're just showing every single bond and ideally with every single lone pair as well. Um, and so this, this is a really good idea, especially while you guys are getting used to writing these structures out, um, even if it does take up a lot of space and even if it is really um, a, a pain to write all of those hydrogens in there. Um, just to make sure that you remember how many electron groups are around each of these and it makes it really easy to remember not to add too many, um, too many hydrogens or too many bonds to that sent to a carbon. Um, what's called the, you'll, we will also frequently see, and I, I kind of default to using this structure when I'm, when I'm drawing stuff on the board, um, is this partially condensed structure, um, which is also called a Kekuli structure. After that German chemist that we talked about, you know, one of those old, old white dead dudes, um, this was the one who got the idea for benzene and, and resonance from, um, from the Ouroboros um, snake from ancient Egypt. Um, but it's the Kekuli structure is basically you do a condensed structure for parts of the molecule and then you draw out some of the bonds for other parts of the molecule. Um, and so the condensed structure is the is sort of continuing that same direction. Condensed structure, you don't draw any of the carbon hydrogen bonds. And condensed structures really, really stem from um, the fact that back before in, in the early days of printing presses and before we had computers and printers available to everybody, um, it was really hard to draw structures by hand and then print them for publication. And so they would find ways to, instead of having to stop, draw a figure, make a custom, you know, a custom print um, tile for it and then print it, they would just write it out as a condensed structure. So it's, it's all built around the idea that can we represent the 3D structure of this molecule in one line, basically, in one text line. Um, and so this is the same molecule as the two to the left. Um, but it's a little bit harder to see what's going on until you know what you're looking for. So CH3 in parentheses two means you have two of these CH3 groups attached to a carbon, which also has hydrogen and also has an OH group. So in the fact that we separate out the OH, the hydrogen that's on the oxygen from the hydrogen that's attached to the carbon is our way of indicating that that OH, that the hydrogen is attached to the oxygen, not the carbon. Right? So we wouldn't write it as, um, we would not write it as, I'll just do this on the, can do it. That, We would not write it as CH3 C CH2O. We would not write it like that because what that is saying is that um, that the two hydrogens are both directly attached. Oh, that did not update over there. Hang on. There it is. We would not write it this way because that's what that's saying is that both of those hydrogens are directly attached to the carbon. And you can't have the two, the two methyl groups attached directly to the carbon and have two hydrogens directly attached to the middle carbon and have room for that oxygen anywhere. 
So by, by breaking apart those other pieces, by not trying to put those two hydrogens with the same subscript, that's our way of saying, okay, this hydrogen is attached to a carbon and this second, the last hydrogen that's written is attached to the oxygen. Um, condensed structure though, like I mentioned, is not as, not as commonly used as it used to be. You'll see it for simple molecules. So you'll see it for very large molecules where you can um, use the parentheses um, to indicate. So if we had a long saturated fatty acid chain, you might see it written as um, something like you could have CH3 and then have a whole bunch of CH2s in a row. And then have, you know, uh, let's say if we had seven of them and then another CH3. So that would be a very a convenient and fast way to draw nine carbons in a row all attached to each other all in one big long straight line. So you will frequently see the parentheses with another subscript for a bunch of repeating pieces in the middle. Um, but that's that's and really a lot in biology you see that because you get those big long repeating polymer units. And then that brings us to our least helpful form, which would be the molecular formula. Um, I mentioned this the other day when we were talking about isomers. Molecular formula, it's you you do run into it still in OCHEM because there are some there are some tests we can do in lab where we can tell exactly what the molecular formula is of a compound, even if we can't tell exactly what that compound is. So it would be you know if we have some unknown, we could test it and find out well it's got you know, four, four carbons, 12 hydrogens and two oxygens or something like that. Um, just by doing what they call elemental analysis. Um, it wouldn't tell us what the compound actually is. So a lot of times you'll see the molecular formula in the context of you have this unknown, but we know the molecular formula for it. And then you have other tests you can run to figure out what it is and you have to find a structure that fits that molecular formula. Um, so it's really sort of the, the lowest common denominator for this is the, the first thing we can figure out when we're trying to figure out what an unknown is. And then last but not least, um, we will frequently see bond line structures are also called skeletal structure. Um, and it's Basically, you don't write any carbons in and you don't write the hydrogens at all. The end of every line is an atom. If it's carbon, you just don't bother writing the symbol for it. If it's something other than carbon, you write that in there. So this is also, so this isopropyl alcohol, um, rubbing alcohol for all of these. So this skeletal structure is saying the same thing as these others. You just, and sometimes you will see it where they will add the hydrogens to the things besides carbon. So you might see it written as, um, and I, I kind of default towards doing this too, where you have the OH written. I got it right in the glare there. or even drawing in the bond between the, the oxygen and the hydrogen as well. That's a little bit less common, but you do see that occasionally. Um, all of those are considered skeletal structure because you're not drawing the carbons in explicitly. Um, we're not gonna use this too much, especially me on the whiteboard or on the slides, um, until I'm sure you can count to four, but not five because getting the molecular formula from this relies on you being able to look at this structure and say, okay, that's a carbon and it has one hydrogen attached to it. That's a carbon and it has three hydrogens attached to it. Cause you basically just need to fill in all of the empty spots with hydrogen until every carbon has four bonds, but not five. Um, and that's all same with the, with the Kukuli structure. Um, it's really probably the Kukuli structure is probably the easiest to mess that up 
because it's really easy to put CH3 and then have two bonds, two other bonds attached to it. And at first glance, it doesn't look like there are too many bonds to the carbon. You know, if I drew something as you know, CH3, CH2, I know I just, I keep switching back and forth between the screen share, um, but I like my whiteboard. So like, this is not entirely obvious right away that there's five bonds to that carbon. Until you know what you're paying attention to, it'd re be really easy to draw a structure like this, um, which you should never do. I'm only doing this as a bad example. My my wrestling coach's motto when you were when you were screwing something up in practice is you're never totally useless. You can always be a bad example. Um, so we would want it to be written more like that. Right. And so and that's what I mean by until you can count to four, but not five. We want to make sure we're being explicit about the number of hydrogens on every on every carbon. Um, anybody seen any other forms or any questions of, on these on these types of structures so far? Looking good. It's you know we're just formalizing things you guys have already seen written in other classes and in and in my class for that matter. Um, but th these are the formal definitions of these structures. Um, and on a test, I might. Um, you know, to especially on the first midterm in OCHEM, I will do things like make, you know, I will underline, draw the complete structure, meaning show me every bond um, for this compound. So, so you can show me that you can count to four, but not five. Um, so let's do, if we have the, the most common type of question to ask about these different structures is make you go back and forth between the structures. Take something in the condensed structure and let's turn it into the complete structure and see if we can figure out how to do this. And it requires a little interpretation sometimes. So why don't you guys each try A here and then we'll go through it on the board. I think that that should help some with the glare by, I forgot I can just move my monitor up and that moves my webcam up high enough that uh, gets rid of that light in the middle of the class or in the middle of the room. All right, so if we're looking at this condensed structure with CH2 with it, and then with a double bond drawn, and if you're typing this in yourself, you um, you can just use an equal sign to represent a double bond. Makes sense. It's convenient. Um, and then we had CHO, 
before. And so remember that with the condensed structure, you're going to always see a carbon and then written after that is what's attached to that carbon. And then you'll see the next carbon and what's attached to that carbon. And then, you, so every time you see a carbon, that's another link in that carbon chain. And so that tells us that that second one says CHO and then another, and then CH2. CHO, there's really only one way we can arrange it so that that second carbon has four bonds and that the oxygen has two bonds. We can't, we wouldn't draw this as an OH group as an oxygen that has a hydrogen attached to it because that CH and then the O tells us that the hydrogen is attached to the carbon. So we have carbon attached to hydrogen, also attached to an oxygen, and then the oxygen is attached to the next CH2. See, and then we had CH, CH3, 2. So that CH3 in parentheses two tells us we have two CH3 groups attached to that, last, that second to last carbon here and one hydrogen attached. All right, so it does require, it's not, going from the condensed structure to the actual structure does require some interpretation. Um, and that's, that's one of the trickier things to figure out how to do. But you, if you remember to pay attention to make sure everything has the right number of bonds, then that's going to be your, your guiding principle for this. Any questions Yusuf? on that? Yeah, Yusuf. Uh, why wouldn't the, the hydrogen be connected to oxygen by the double bond? Um, because the way it was written, so if it's if the hydrogen was attached to the oxygen, we would write it the way it's written on B. If you look at B, at the very end, it's got OH. If we wanted to write the structure that you're suggesting, we would write it as, let me just throw a text box in here, and I'll do the condensed structure that way. It would be CH2 equals, and then be, we write it as COH, and then CH2. So that's suggesting that the hydrogen, the hydrogens are, are pretty much always going to be attached to what they're written directly after. So the fact that we wrote CH and then the O tells us that the hydrogen is attached to the carbon. If we write CO and then the H, that tells us that the hydrogen is attached to the oxygen. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. And just because now that I've started, I have to finish writing this. So that would be the, the compound where we had the OH group, which is a functional group called an alcohol. All right, let's, let's try B. Give that a second, and then I'll draw it up on the board. Thank you. 
So if we're being we'll go over this here. So again, if we're trying to go all the way to the complete structure, then a lot of times filling in all your hydrogens is going to be the part that takes the longest. Um, but if we're looking at, so we have CH3, CH2 twice. So I would start by writing this carbon here in the middle and then add two CH2, two CH3, CH2 groups to it. So there's one of the CH3, CH2 groups. There's the other one. Then we, the, both of those were attached to the same carbon. And they wouldn't be in a row. You wouldn't say CH3, CH2 in parentheses two would not be four carbons in a row because a CH3 by definition has to be at the end of a carbon chain because it's already got three bonds between carbon and hydrogen. So it can only be attached to one other thing. So even though there's four carbons in that one little, in that first little section there, we wouldn't draw them all as one big long group. So then we have this carb CH and then another carbon CH2, CH2, OH. And if we're being really careful about doing the, the complete Lewis structure, you would want to draw that your lone pairs on there. We forgot on that last one. It's not that critical, um, especially as long as we're getting used to remembering oxygen has lone pairs on it and nitrogen that's neutral has lone pairs. Um, so it's not that critical to pay attention to, but worth remembering. And usually it's not a bad idea to always write your lone pairs in. They, they're easier to draw than your um, than hydrogens anyway. Any questions about why I did it the way I did? Let me see what the next one was. Uh, so then there's some more practice um, taking skeletal structure and we'll do we'll do one of those. Um, let's do let's do aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid. Draw the complete structure for that. So remember, so same thing we just did, except now we're going from skeletal structure to complete structure. So starting by doing the filling in the ring structure, each of these carbons in the ring structure already has three bonds just by being in that benzene ring. You've got a pi bond between two carbons and then two sigma bonds to the adjacent carbons. So you can only have at most one other thing attached to each of these carbons in the ring. So the part, the rings, the parts of the ring that are that have something else besides hydrogen attached are not going to have any hydrogens on the carbon here. I ran myself out of room there at the top. <laughs> <laughs> 
So if you can see, I'm very glad I have my much larger whiteboard compared to last year. Um, makes life way easier for drawing these structures so that you guys can actually read them. Once we get this drawn, coming up with the molecular formula, figuring out how many carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens total is not too tricky. It's just a matter of keeping track. Um, but getting the right number of hydrogens in the first place is the easiest place to mess up on the molecular formula. Um, trying to figure out what the total number of carbons, oxygens, and hydrogens is. Which for this molecule would be something like, so C, six, seven, eight, nine, C nine. H three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. H nine O four. Why would we care about the molecular formula if we've already got the, the structure drawn in front of us? It's easier to read. It's easier to read. It's easier to figure out the molecular weight. It's the big one. If you want to do something like percent yield, figure out what your theoretical yield should be, you need a molecular weight, right? It's a lot easier to take this and turn it into a molecular weight than it is the, the skeletal structure. So it will still show up. And molecular formula does have its place for that reason. All right, I'll leave, we'll leave the other two of those for you guys. You guys can use them, do them as practice. If you like, you can check your answers by just plugging in these compounds into MolView and then having MolView, turning on the show hydrogens button on MolView um, to see if you, if you counted everything up properly, um, if you want some more practice with that. Um, it's a lot easier to go from a complete formula to a skeletal structure. So we'll go ahead, let's practice that direction real quick and then we'll move on. So we're turning this complete structure into the skeletal structure. So this is a fairly complicated structure, so it's not necessarily um, simple to go, go and do the, to, what I would normally recommend is be starting with the carbons, draw all the carbons, but in this case, we don't have all the carbons directly attached to each other. So it gets a little bit left. And the other thing to remember is you don't have to start at the left-hand side of the molecule. You can start wherever is convenient. So in this case, there's a bunch of the, of the carbons that are all together on the right-hand side. If you wanted to do your, your skeletal structure for the chunk of carbons on the right-hand side first and then add this other section, that's not necessarily a bad idea. Um, so if you just started by counting, okay, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in a row on the right-hand side and try and draw them and then add in branches, add in the extra pieces hanging off the side or the pie bonds as appropriate. Um, 
if you did start on the left hand side, I would draw your first two carbons first and say, okay, there's my first two carbons. The first carbon has an OH has an oxygen attached to it. The second carbon also has an oxygen attached to it, but it's not an OH, it's an oxygen and then another CH2 group. And then attached to that CH2 group is a carbon triple bonded to another carbon, which in, if we we're doing true skeletal structure, we would write like this. This is a little easy, or a little easy to, to miscount your carbons though if you do that. And so it's not necessarily a bad idea to write in the two carbons on either end of that triple bond because it's, it's going to be linear, right? Because you only have two electron groups on each of these carbons and trying to draw a straight line that represents four carbons, one, two, three, four, it's easy to miscount them when you have a triple bond in there like that. So it's not wrong. Even if I say draw the skeletal structure, it's not wrong in this case to draw the carbons for a for a carbon-carbon triple bond um, to make sure that you count both of them. And then expand this a little bit. So after the carbon-carbon triple bond, we had another carbon, which was sp2. So it was a had another pi bond here. And those pi bonds are going to be, are we going to make it trigonal planar, right? So it is still going to be at an angle now. And then the second carbon of that double bond had two CH3s attached. A single carbon there, a single carbon there. Anybody have any questions about why I drew something the way I did? Uh, when you were just explaining the uh, geometries, it made sense that the triple bond would be straight in between the other two carbons. When you're first writing this out, when you're first taking this, your instinct with the carbons pretty soon is going to be put all of them at about the same angle, that same 120 degrees for the most part. Um, and if you did that and then added a triple bond in one spot, um, that's, that's not a bad first step. And I, on a test, I might dock you half a point for that if you made it, if you didn't make it linear. Um, so it's not the, the end of the world, but if once you get a triple bond, if I did have it drawn bent, one, two, If you ever draw that, anytime you see a triple bond, your next thought should be, oh, okay, I, I should redraw that section and straighten it out. But as far as getting started on getting your all the carbons on the paper when you're doing this translation, that's fine. I, You would probably want to, though, then redraw that. Okay, I'm going to redraw the exact same thing. I'm just going to make this section linear. Yeah, because in reality, it would have to be linear, yeah. Right. right. And one of the advantages of the, of the um, skeletal structure over condensed structure, or even complete structure, is that we can show the shapes a little bit more accurately in most cases. So it's, it's a good idea. All right. Last Last topic for this week um, is the idea of a functional group. Uh, and I've, I'm sure I've already used this term once, but you may not have caught it. Um, and a, a functional group has a definition in the textbook that says it's a characteristic group of atoms or bonds that possess predictable chemical behavior. So basically it's anything that you can recognize that's going to be that's um, going to react the same way every time, no matter what molecule it's in, it's going to react the same way. And so anytime you can see a similar or a repeating structural motif, uh, 
Um, so for instance, like a benzene ring, anybody who's taken, taken cell bio knows that benzenes show up all over the place, right? Um, or just, you know, those uh, cyclo, cyclo groups in general show up all over the place. You could consider that a functional group. And it's a little bit arbitrary um, depending on, you know, what we're trying to talk about. We could say that a cycloalkane, which would be just a, um, a group of sp3 carbons that are attached in a, in a ring structure, we could consider that a functional group. Oh, sorry, I did not go back to sharing screen. Hang on. Um, so, and there, so there are different kind of levels and it's, we can kind of make them, define them as however is convenient for us when it comes to, um, when it comes to discussing these things. Um, you can have similar groups of atoms that are in two, that are two different functional groups, for instance, um, if we looked at a, Uh, and this is also worth mentioning because I always forget to define this. Um, in organic chemistry, anytime you see R, R is just a placeholder. It just means when you have this attached to anything else, R can be another hydrogen, but usually it just means a carbon, more carbons, something else that it's attached to. So this part, This entire group of atoms is called the carboxylic acid. That's one functional group. But this functional group really has within it two functional groups. It's got the carbon double bonded to an oxygen can, could be considered its own functional group. So this functional group, we could have our own definition for that. And that's anytime you've got a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, we call it a carbonyl. Um, with a Y out. So, and it's not important that you get these names down right now. I'll show you in a second, but we can say that the red is a carboxylic acid. So the entire group is a carboxylic acid, which is made up of a carbonyl and an OH group, which we'll call a hydroxyl. Right, so the point I'm trying to make here is just that sometimes it's convenient for us to just describe this as this entire thing as a carboxylic acid. Sometimes when, we're start, when we start talking about things like how reactions happen, the mechanism of a reaction, it might be convenient to talk about the carbonyl carbon or the carbonyl oxygen as separate from the hydroxyl oxygen. So it's basically, a functional group is a convenient way of describing a group of atoms. Right? And so we're gonna try to be as consistent as we can with by using those names very specifically um, so that we can be very, so we don't wind up um, describing things in an ambiguous way. Um, but that's the, the whole point behind functional groups is just that it's a convenient way of describing things, similar to hybridization. So if we looked at this first molecule on the left here, we could describe the various parts of this molecule a few different ways. We could say um, that we could talk about the sp3 carbons. We could talk about the sp2 carbons. Another way of describing the sp2 carbons is if they're, if it's two carbon, two carbons bound together with a pi bond, we could describe that as, as an alkene would be the name of the functional group. And then um, if we have a bunch of carbons and hydrogens with nothing else attached to it, that's what's known as an alkane. And make sure, I, yeah, the next slide has a whole bunch of different examples, but the the point of, of these is that each of these alkenes, each of these carbon-carbon double bonds, if you put it with hydrogen gas with platinum as a catalyst, they're all going to do the exact same reaction. They're all going to take that carbon-carbon pi bond and you're going to add a hydrogen to each side of it to take 
to break that pi bond and turn it into two carbon carbon or two carbon hydrogen sigma bonds. Right, so it doesn't matter what the alkene is. It doesn't matter what the rest of the molecule looks like because the functional group of an alkene is going to react the same way each time. Um, and we're going to add a whole bunch of functional groups by the end of this series. Um, we're going to take, start with the simple ones and kind of get more complicated. Um, but, for, but we're going to have to describe them using the proper terms. And so we're going, one of the first things that's gonna be on your quiz this weekend is going to be just what functional group is this and fill it in. Um, and so it's just a matter of learning some vocabulary. Carbon-carbon double bond is an alkene. A carbon-oxygen double bond is a carbonyl. And then there are different types of carbonyls. There's a carbon-carbon double bond or sorry, carbon-oxygen double bond with two R groups, where you have two, a carbon attached to either side of it is called a ketone. But a carbon-oxygen double bond with a carbon on one side and a hydrogen attached to the carbon reacts differently. They're both, they both have that carbon-oxygen carbonyl group, but the aldehyde has a hydrogen attached to that carbon and the ketone has two carbons attached, right? So subtle differences in, in a lot of these, um, but they, and they do react differently. There's a lot of similarities between aldehydes and ketones, but they don't react. They're not identical in how they react. So we, have, we refer to them as two different functional groups. Um, I believe that this table is just at the beginning of chapter two in the textbook. Um, it just has this big, list of functional groups or just go to the slides to look at these. Um, and al so an alkane is all carbon carbons and carbon hydrogens. An alkene is a carbon carbon double bond and alkyne is a carbon carbon triple bond. Um, and then you've got, you've got alcohols is when you have an OH group attached um, to an sp3 carbon. An ether is when you have two carbon chains linked together by an oxygen, where you don't have, you have an oxygen in between those two carbons. Um, you got alkyl halides. Alkyl is, a, is a, an adjective that just means a bunch of sp3 carbons. Um, and so an alkyl halide just means you have a halogen attached to an sp3 carbon. but that's different than an acyl halide down here. An acyl halide is when you have a halogen attached to an sp2 carbon, specifically a carbonyl, where you have a carbon-oxygen double bond. So it's subtle differences with these um, that we wanna pay attention to. And you'll see a lot of repeating structures though. A carbonyl attached to an OH group, to a hydroxyl is an acid. A carbonyl attached to an, a halide is, is called an, an acid halide or an acyl halide. Um, if you have a carbonyl attached to an oxygen that then has another carbon on the other side, that's an ester. But it has the same general shape for a lot of these. Carbonyl attached to something else that's electronegative. Um, amides, there's a whole bunch of different functional groups on here. And so over the weekend, um, read these. Try to get familiar with some of these names. Try to pay attention to what the difference is. Don't, when you're doing the quiz, let me put it this way. Um, if you see a halogen, don't just automatically put ACL halide. Make sure that there's no other functional group on this list that also has a halogen that fits better. Does that make sense? It's until you get used to knowing what the options are while you're still learning this, check all the options to make sure that you pick the best one. Um, but these are all going to be so second nature to you in a, you know, in a few weeks that um, it's, yes, you had to memorize them now, but we're going to keep adding these in. And we're going to add one functional group at a time, basically. You can see that um, they have different chapter numbers for these. So we're going to, the first six chapters are just talking about hydrocarbons, are just talking about um, 
alkanes and structures and things like that. And then we start adding these functional groups in. We're adding an acyl halide, adding alkenes, and adding alkynes. And we're going to at, talk about the different reactions that make those functional groups or that those functional groups can go through one at a time. So it seems overwhelming right now, but don't worry. We're, you know, baby steps, one step at a time. So no need to memorize the whole list right off the bat? Um, at least get familiar with them. Um, but not, I wouldn't know necessarily make yourself flashcards right away. Um, be familiar with the names, especially some of the ones that are kind of similar to each other. Know what the difference is between an alcohol and an acid. They both have an OH group, but the but an alcohol ju has just an OH group, and an acid has the OH and a carbonyl. So at least know what some of the ones that are that show up in multiple places. Be familiar with what makes them different from each other. Um, even if you have to keep this as a cheat sheet and, you know, constantly refer back to it, just start getting familiar with it. Um, one of my favorite ways to ask questions about functional groups when you guys are still just learning them um, is to basically say, okay, label all the functional groups in this big complicated molecule. So these are both um, heart medications. And so we can go through and find, when I say label all the functional groups, it gets a little bit of a fine line because there's like, well, an NH2, that's an amine, but it's attached to a carbonyl. Is it an amine and an amide or is it just an amide? Um, and so there's a little bit of room for, for disagreement or for, you know, debating where that, that line actually is. But main thing is we find the major functional groups in here and they're mostly going to be either you're going to be looking for something that's not a carbon or you're looking for pi bonds or both. We wouldn't label a section that has nothing attached to it as being an alkane. Alkane is sort of like the, the lowest common denominator. If it's nothing else, it's an alkane. If there's anything else attached to it, we would classify it by what else is attached to it. So if we're trying to Look at this first one. So I can't, I can't draw on this slide and be zoomed in. So can you guys see it well enough if I do this or should I zoom in and just use my, okay. Um, so if we're trying to label all the different functional groups, you can start by just going left to right. First time you run into something that's not a carbon is this nitrogen. So that's a functional group. That's an amine. An amine is anytime you've got an sp3 nitrogen attached to sp3 carbons it's an amine and space amine amine is the functional group um if we keep going left to right we've got a hydroxyl here an oh group that oh group is attached to an sp3 carbon which makes it an alcohol if it was an if it was an OH group attached to an sp2 carbon, we would have to look at what else there was to determine what it is. But in this case, if it's an sp3 carbon and you see an OH, it's an alcohol. Anytime you see an oxygen linking together two carbons, that's an ether. If one of the carbons is a carbonyl, is a carbon oxygen double bond, then that's an ester. So ethers and esters are easy to get mixed up too. It's that same thing. Look for what it's between. Is it between, um, does it, if there was an O8 or an oxygen over here, then it would be the ester. Um, this whole group, benzene rings in general, are their own functional group. Um, also see them described as being um, a phenyl group, P-H-E-N-Y-L. Mm, where's my slides? A anytime you see phenyl, that means it's a benzene ring or it's, it's um, a series of rings sometimes can still be referred to as, as aromatic rings and we'll talk about the definition and why 
or why some compounds that are rings are aromatic and others aren't. And then last but not least, we get to a carbonyl, a carbon oxygen double bond. And anytime you see a carbonyl, carbonyls are always going to be classified as as part of another functional group. So that tells us that we're looking basically on the right hand side of that chart. Um, all, where, where all the, the carbonyl compounds were. And so a carbon oxygen double bond where the carbon is attached to a nitrogen. That whole group is a amide. So this group up here would be an amide. Group that's that's just a nitrogen attached to a carbon is an amine. And so you wouldn't be wrong to, to circle some of these other things that are just sp3 carbons, you wouldn't be wrong to circle that and write alkane. Um, but if there's so much other, so many other um, functional groups on this molecule, if we're labeling functional groups, we wouldn't even consider labeling the alkane normally because it's, it's boring. It's the lowest, you know, the, the last option. If there's nothing else, you call it an alkane. If there's anything else going on, you classify it by what those other functional, what that other functional group or groups is. Did I miss anything there? Any questions about any of the, the splitting hairs on that one? All right. Let's see what was on the next one. We had few more struck a few more slides here. I'll leave the other one for now, the enalperil. Um, once you actually also once you start seeing some of these um, functional group names, you can actually start seeing them in common medication names. Um, if I go back to this one, um, acetaminophen, acetaminophen and acet an acetyl group is a CH3 attached to a carbonyl that's attached to something else. So you've got an acetyl group. You've got this nitrogen. Anytime you see A-M-I-N in a medication name, that means that you've got a nitrogen in there somewhere. And then P-H-E-N is for phenyl, for the benzene ring. So you start seeing these in a lot of, of common names in medications really have the the pieces all in there. Um, amphetamine. The amine in amphetamine is a nitrogen attached to a carbon. And the PHE in amphetamine stands for a benzene ring. So it doesn't give you enough information that you could draw the complete structure and be right, but it tells you kind of vaguely when they're picking these names for the medications before they used to have things like, you know, market, um, market studies and, uh, you know, study groups to figure not study focus groups to figure out what names test well um but they the chemists would be in charge of naming these things coming up with a common name and they would just smash a bunch of functional groups together and pick a pick a word that sounded good to them so there's no rhyme or reason as to which order no not really it. just what no. sounds good yeah, generally speaking, and now, like I said, it's all done with focus groups and they test the names before they actually, you know, submit them as the official name for any new, um, for any new molecules, new medications. So there's, you know, I'm trying to think, um, lorazepam or something like that. There's not necessarily any, anything to that, um, especially for the way that they're marketed, you know, the, the, the real name, the generic name might have some of those pieces, but definitely not the brand names. All right, last, I said last concept on the last slide, but um, we, this isn't really a new concept. This is just formalizing, no pun intended, um, what we've been doing when it comes to these charges. We've talked about charges a little bit already. 
this is just a few slides that um, remind us that counting the number of bonds and um, allows us to figure out whether we have lone pairs or hydrogens attached so that charges on the different on different elements will tell us a lot about what else is still attached. So if we have hydroxymethyl furfural, um, one thing you do still see is anything that ends in AL as its chemical name is going to be an aldehyde. You're going to have an aldehyde in there somewhere. So hydroxymethyl furfural, um, on each, when I say heavy atom, a heavy atom is anything that's not hydrogen. We're still going to continue adding hydrogen in as much as we need to fill valences and make the formal charge zero, um, unless you otherwise stated. So on every heavy atom, if we wanted to count number of lone pairs, label the lone pairs and count the hydrogens on every heavy atom, we would just go through and count bonds like we did um, when we practiced going to the complete structure. So are there any other hydrogens on the oxygen here, on this alcohol group? It's already got two bonds. It's got a bond between the oxygen and the carbon over here, and it's got a bond oxygen to hydrogen. So it's got two lone pairs, though. And lone pairs are my least favorite thing to try and draw with a mouse. That kind of works. Um, any lone pairs on this sp3 carbon here? No. No, carbon's never going to have lone pairs unless it has a negative charge. But it does have two hydrogens. Any lone pairs or any hydrogens on this carbon here? I already said carbon's not going to have any lone pairs unless it's got a charge. It's all, this carbon already has four bonds. So no, uh, no hydrogens here. Any hydrogens or lone pairs on this oxygen in the middle? Two lone pairs. Two lone pairs. If there's no charge on an oxygen, it's got two lone pairs. So might as well do the other oxygen while we're at it, right? Two bonds to the oxygen, no charge on it. Therefore, there's two lone pairs. We have one hydrogen explicitly drawn onto this carbonyl carbon, and we see that with aldehydes mostly. If you're going to see a hydrogen explicitly drawn when it's attached to just a carbon, it's almost always because it's an aldehyde, and they're making sure you're paying attention to that. If there was, but you will also frequently just see aldehydes written as something that just looks like. Oops. If it was skeletal structure, we'd see it written as as this. We just have there's the carbon from a skeletal structure, double bond to an oxygen with nothing attached to it. That's also a good a way that aldehydes. That's the way aldehydes should be drawn, following the rules of skeletal structures more carefully. But it's also really common to see them drawn like that. If you see it drawn something like this, now all of a sudden that's not an aldehyde anymore. Because an aldehyde, by definition, is at the end of a carbon ring or a carbon chain. This ketone or this carbonyl is in the middle of a carbon chain, which makes it a ketone instead. Any hydrogens on the um, carbons at the bottom of this ring here? It's one. How many on each? Just one. All right, so if we have more, if we have a charge anywhere, that's going to affect this. It's going to affect how we're going to, to draw this. If you put a... Um, a nitrogen with a positive charge on it, 
say we had this this ring structure drawn. So it's it's a six sided ring with one of the carbons replaced with a nitrogen that has a positive charge. How many hydrogens are attached to that nitrogen? So if it, if it didn't have a charge at all, we know nitrogen when it's neutral needs three bonds, right? So that would be if it was neutral. If it's got a positive charge, it's sharing more than it wants to, right? So nitrogen with a positive charge has four bonds. And so it's, um, the charge will tell us a lot about how many hydrogens are attached to things. Um, this still doesn't violate the octet rule though, right? Because it still only has a total of eight electrons around the nitrogen. You can't put a positive charge on a carbon and attach another hydrogen because it already has four bonds, right? So a carbon with a positive charge, something else has to be going on. And we'll get to that when we, in, in a little bit. But oxygen with a positive charge has three bonds. Nitrogen with a positive charge has four bonds. Um, in theory, you could have a chlorine with a positive charge would have two bonds. All right, so that's, that's why the formal charge winds up being really important is because it helps us pay attention to where there are hydrogen. And then it's also going to play a big role in what's, what's going to react. Because if you have a positive charge on part of the molecule, that's going to be attracted to a negative charge elsewhere, right? So if we have a negative negatively charged molecule floating around and we have a positively charged molecule floating around the positive and the negative parts of each molecule are going to be drawn together and more likely to react with each other is almost that, sorry do you mind if i interject is that what when you get like a hcl in a type of medication a hydrochloride salt of something is that positive and negative charges coming together or no yes um you see that most often so a lot of medications are amines and at physiological pH, at pH close to neutral, um, nitrogens tend to be protonated. They tend to have that extra hydrogen added to them, so they have a positive charge. So anytime you see hydrochloride on a medication, what that's saying is that your nitrogen is protonated, so this whole molecule has a positive charge, but you have to balance it out, that you can't have an ionic compound with with um, just a charge, you have to have the negative charge that goes with it. Or you could also think of it, the reason it's named hydrochloride is because what they're saying is that the hydrogen that protonates that nitrogen came from hydrochloric acid. So when you say, when you see hydrochloride, what that's saying is you have an ionic compound where your medication has a positive charge and it's, that charge is balanced out with the chloride. Um, you'll see like sulfate is common too. You'll see um, some medications where it's balanced out with a sulfate and that just has to do with stability. Somebody else have a question? Uh, you answered it. I was going to say they do that to make it more stable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and if you, if you deprotonate an amine, it's going to change its properties. It's actually all of a sudden it's going to have a much higher, oh, we're already going over. Sorry. Um, finish my thought and won't be done. It'll, it's going to have it um, when it's protonated and, and when it's an ionic compound, it's going to have a much higher boiling point. Um, and so when you deprotonate a medication, it actually has a much lower boiling point and is therefore can be abused more easily. That's what, what free basing actually is like crack cocaine versus cocaine is you take, you get cocaine is cocaine hydrochloride. If you deprotonate the cocaine, you turn it into crack. And then it can be smoked instead of, you know, taken orally or however. Right. So that's, it plays a big role in a lot of medication and pharmaceuticals because you can't, anything that's nonpolar and won't dissolve in water, you can't administer orally. So if you want a medication to be able to be administered orally, you have to find a way to make it soluble in water, which is usually means you protonate or you deprotonate to give it a charge. All right, we've gone over for the day.